You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. Thank you, Pastor Jamie. For whatever reason, I don't know, but I decided to split firewood yesterday. And it's a little stiff up here today, so... But I'm so glad I'm not a runner. Our pastors are out running for a a half marathon, I think it is, for World Vision. God bless them for doing that, but I think it's a blessing that I don't have to. I remember back to 1972, the Munich Olympic Games. And the marathon is always like the final thing that they do. It's like the big deal because the marathons uh, were what actually inspired the Greek Olympic Games, I think, or how, somehow it was tied in there. This particular year, Frank Shorter was going to be expected to win, and Frank had this technique all worked out. He had been practicing that about halfway through the, the marathon, he was going to break away from the pack and surprise everybody and burn everybody out, but then just keep going And he did that. He was like two minutes ahead of everybody else. Just before he entered the stadium, some other guy comes trotting in, all fresh off the street, and he's running around, and the crowd doesn't know. They think, oh, here's the guy from from the marathon. They're all cheering him on, and he gets halfway around. The commentators are coming unglued, like, this guy's an imposter, grab him. It wouldn't happen today. They'd wrestle him down, you know, taser him or whatever, and he'd be dragged off. But he was halfway around the track. Frank Shorter is coming in. He gets into the the stadium, and he's thinking, I got it nailed just to take this victory lap. And he sees this other goomer going around the other side, and he's like, and he doesn't know what's going on. He's thinking, I did all this. I ran half this race thinking I got it nailed. I get in here. Somebody else got me beat. Frank gets across the finish line, and he just goes like this, and he shakes his head back and forth a couple times like he didn't win it. And the other guy, he just trots out back onto the street. Nobody, I don't never heard anything, whatever whatever happened to the guy, but Frank did win it. But it was just an, an amazing thing to watch this imposter come in. There's a sermon there. We're not going there today, but maybe sometime when they run a marathon in the future, I'll have one prepared. Anyways, for, I would love to be a, 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 a runner, but I can't because I have uh, nerve damage in my left leg. But literally, one of the things, I don't dream much, but one of the things I dream about is running. And it's just like Forrest Gump. I'll get up and I'll start going a little bit faster and all of a sudden all the braces fall off and I'm just a running and it is so wonderful, the freedom. And then, of course, I wake up. So we, <clears throat> we are really blessed to live in this uh, area of West Michigan. I'm from Grand Haven. You are perhaps from other places around here. <clears throat> but Grand Haven, Haven is one letter away from heaven. I like to really think that. But a haven is a place of safety or a place of refuge, and we live just a little bit off the river. You can go and look, and you can go like a mile each way, and there's all kinds of wildlife out there. And what I notice is the things that are new and the things that are no longer there. Now, these may not be new to Michigan, but they're new to me. We get these white egrets out there, beautiful white birds. They're getting more and more White pelicans, people call me crazy. Read the Grand Haven Tribune, they're right in there. They've been here all, there's a couple of them been here all summer long. White pelicans in Michigan. This year, across the pond in Wisconsin, they've got flamingos showed up. And the graylings that are now, have been extinct from 1936 are about to be replanted. Those will be back. Grayling is a beautiful fish uh, that was common in Michigan years ago. But then there's things that disappear. The frogs are all gone. I pay attention to this stuff. It went about four years ago. There were thousands of them out there in the springtime. You could hear them. Last year, I heard just a couple. This year, I heard one. They're all gone. Turtles used to come up in June and lay eggs on everybody's property, which dug it all up, but they all thought it was pretty cool. Not this year. Not a single turtle that we know of in our area. They're all gone. Insects are disappearing, which everyone likes, but... (laughs) 
If you don't have insects, there's nothing at the food chain, bottom of the food chain to feed the rest of us. So things have come and things have gone. But the word of God in Genesis 8 says this, as long as earth endures, seed time and harvest will never cease. We are right in that season of harvest in many ways. But here in Michigan, did a little search back in 2018. It's still probably pretty accurate. Michigan is number two in the nation for the diversity of agricultural products. Number two to California. I was surprised. We are number one in asparagus, number one in tart cherries, number one in chestnuts. Anybody eat chestnuts? I thought they were extinct. I, you do? Well, good. It, but it only takes one tree, I guess, if they were almost extinct, to be number one in the nation. So at least we got one chestnut tree. We're number one in cucumbers. We're number one in potatoes that are used to make potato chips, my favorite food. And put that together, and you got pickled chips, and that's apparently Pastor Jamie's one of her favorite foods. I don't know where to get those. I'm not sure why I would want to eat them, but I'm not here to judge. And we're number three in sugar beets and Christmas trees, and the list goes on and on. We got a lot of stuff going on here. But this morning I want to talk about a continuation of what we've been talking about, of fruit for all seasons. <clears throat> Jesus said in Matthew 21, early in the morning, or he didn't say this, but this was him. As Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And the tree withered. The significance of that is in representation of the nation of Israel and their lack of fruit when they should be in fruit in season, but they missed their time. What I'm looking at here is just the practical application. Because in the, in the uh, biblical times, and still today I'm sure fig trees are, are common, but it was known that if a fig tree leafed out, the fruit was soon there to follow. And if it did not have fruit, it was a barren tree. Cut it down, get rid of it. You know, in Michigan here, we grow lots of apple trees. But if you have an apple tree that does not bear fruit, you're going to cut it down, send it off for firewood, and you're going to replant one that will bear fruit. It's the same in our lives, believers. We need to bear fruit. But I believe there's a grace period. If you come into the family of God, I'm sure that God is giving you and us all a grace period of a time where we can plant our roots and become firmly founded, mature, but at some point, we should bear fruit for the kingdom. Otherwise, what good are we? And we get a list of the fruit that we should see in Galatians 5. But we first start out with the contrast of what shouldn't be bearing on your tree. Called the acts of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. People who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Against these things there is no law. If you have this fruit being bared on your branches, that you are following God's desire for your life. It's pretty simple. He lays it out. He gives us such an easy thing to follow. But what is fruit? Biologically, it's the seed-containing result of a flower. Humanly, it's the successful outcome of one's labor. Biblically, it's the evidence of a transformed life. In other words, it's what you produce. We can say that since trees exist, we can expect apples, peaches, pears, pine cones. Because factories exist, they produce too. We can expect cars and computers and contraptions. Because textile mills exist, we can expect towels and socks and bedspreads and underwear. Fruit of the loom. And because the Holy Spirit exists in you, we can expect love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
And there's a reason. Because you and I have been created in the image of God. And each one of these on the list is a reflection of his attributes, just some of his attributes. 1 John 4 says this, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is. John 15, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. To, uh, 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Joel 2.13, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. Mark 10.18, Jesus is talking with a man who is bantering with him, and he says, he calls Jesus good, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Because only God is good. So we see God's attribute as being good, but he also uses this to get that man to understand that he's calling Jesus God. Lamentations 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Isaiah 40, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will carry them in his bosom and gently, with gentleness, lead those that are with young. In Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. God doesn't need to have self-control because he is the definition of self-control. This morning, I want to focus on just two of those attributes for two reasons. The first reason is that's what Pastor Ben assigned me to talk about. <clears throat> but as I'm researching and going through this, I'm realizing those two attributes are key to the whole list because if you source them with love, the first fruit, and you govern them with self-control, the last fruit, those two will express every attribute on that list. Goodness. It's being morally and ethically virtuous, genuine, the real deal. It's an inner quality, a core value, a foundational element. In the New Testament, we hear it spoken as righteousness. In the Old Testament, it's justness. Kindness now is behaving friendly, generously, considerately, sincere, being a nice person. It's an outer action, a visible characteristic, a manifestation. In the New Testament, we see it as compassion. In the Old Testament, we see it as mercy. Goodness is what you are, and kindness is what you do. You really can't separate them. They have to work together. But you know, we can do these things out of our own selfishness to gain things. But God requires us to draw from a deeper source. One of the examples I've chose this morning comes from the book of Micah. Micah was a prophet back in the 7th century or 6th century before Jesus. In chapter 6, 6, he says this. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Let me put that into perspective. Because a burnt offering was the most expensive offering of all. It burned 24 hours a day out in the altar of the tabernacle or the temple. And it was usually a bull, fully grown animal, not one they just pulled out of the field. This is one that was raised from a calf with an attendant 
that made sure that this thing didn't stumble and fall, step into a pothole, it didn't get mud on it, it was clean all the time, all of its hair was perfect, the right color all laid down just right. It didn't get bit by flies, it didn't have tick bites, it didn't have scars. Think about raising a bull to maturity and keeping that much attendance on it. That's an expensive offering. And it's typically offered for the nation of Israel for their sins. Then a ram. A ram is an adult sheep. Sheep were the typical offering for the family because they didn't have to be brought through their whole life and kept perfect, but they had to be perfect. So they raised them in their home almost like a pet to be sure that they were spotless, they were perfect. But a ram goes on to live and do an adult life. It also has to have an attendant to make sure that it grows and matures spotless and free of every blemish. It's an expensive, an expensive offering. And then rivers of olive oil. Today, olive oil is, good stuff is anywhere from 10 to 50 bucks a, a pint. It was expensive back then too. Imagine a river of olive oil. It is impossible, there's not enough olive oil trees. What Micah is saying, if I offer to you the world, God, everything in it, would that please you? And God says, I'll tell you what will please me. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly, to be good inside, and to love mercy, to show compassion. Seven centuries later, Jesus, in Matthew 22, he's confronted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they tried to get him to trip up so they can call him a heretic and have him justifiably put to death, but he answers every question so perfectly they finally give up. One of those questions is, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6, his words that he spoke to his inspired prophets centuries ago. He's speaking them back again, and he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, but there's a second like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Taking that second one, loving your neighbor as yourself, it's a nurturing a relationship to those people that God calls your neighbor with a love that gives without requiring anything in return. It's called agape love. The Greeks had arguably up to nine words that represented love. Four of them were used in the New Testament. Eros, phylos, storge, and agape. Those first three on the list get something back in return, but agape gets nothing. It's unconditional, it's sacrificial, Agape love gives with no expectations for anything, not even acknowledgement or praise. It's a love that does not dishonor others. It considers others more important than self. It's not prone to anger. It keeps no record of wrongs. It's crucial in transforming that outer manifestation of niceness into a genuine, tangible character trait of compassion that Jesus showed throughout his ministry. And back to the first part. Love the Lord your God with absolutely everything you have. It's having a relationship again with agape love to our God. It requires nothing in return from him. It always protects his honor. It always trusts his promises. It always hopes for what we cannot see. It always perseveres through sorrow, suffering, and dismay. It's a foundational in developing that inner goodness that God desires to plant within each of us through his Holy Spirit. It's a character trait that, just like love, never fails. Thirty years ago, a friend of mine came into work on a Monday morning, and he said after this service, he handed me this note. He says, have we come to the place where God can withdraw his blessing and it does not affect our trust in him? That note was profound. I saved it, obviously. 
But I ask you this, based on that, are we in the relationship with God where he could never again acknowledge us, bless us, allow us to feel his presence, and we would still continue to love him and trust him? Because that is what agape love requires, that we give everything to God and expect nothing in return. We're all familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And in that chapter, about in the middle, is a list of things of what love really is. We should all internalize that and understand that fully. Because love is not like, and love is not receiving things because we gave things love that God is expecting here is sacrificial. But I want to swap out the word love for kindness and goodness and see how that flows because I think they're interchangeable. Kindness is patient. Goodness is kind. Neither of them envy, neither of them boast, neither are proud. Kindness does not dishonor others. Goodness is not self-seeking. Kindness is not easily angered. Goodness keeps no record of wrongs. Neither of them delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. Kindness always protects goodness, always trusts goodness, always hopes, kindness always perseveres. Goodness and kindness, rooted in love, never fails. In John 15, Jesus gives us a good analogy of bearing fruit. I'll just read two verses from it. He says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Jesus said that, not me. John, or James, his, his half-brother later, decades later, says this, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? What if we swapped out the word deeds for fruit? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, keep well fed, but nothing, does nothing about their physical needs. Imagine that. Someone comes they need food, and they need shelter, and they need clothing. And you say, be blessed. Have a great day. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action or fruit, is dead. So how then can we apply goodness and kindness and all the fruit of the Spirit in a tangible way or a tangerinable way being fruit of the Spirit. Let's go through this list. Starting with love. Agape love gives freely and sacrificially. So therefore, start giving with no expectations. Baby steps. But give things to people in need, and don't even expect gratitude or acknowledgement even that you've given something to them. And above all, don't expect praise. Give help or support to someone in secret without taking credit. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Put that into practice. Baby steps, and they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and it'll become a pattern in your life. Joy, supernatural gladness, most evident during hard times. So focus on eternity rather than your temporal, worldly circumstances. Avoid an analyzing positive versus negative circumstances or experiences because they all work together for good. James says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And then peace, a divine tranquility while in a place of turmoil or chaos. 
Shift your focus away from yourself and to what God's purpose is in that circumstance. And you'll find peace automatically comes in to the void or the space removed. Philippians 4 says, Be not anxious about anything, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Patience is long-suffering, forbearance, perseverance, steadfastness. Boy, those are some cool words. And don't pray for patience. Everyone has always told me, don't pray for patience because you'll get all kinds of testing to build that up. But as Stephen Covey said, seek first to understand the situation or the person and then seek to be understood. It puts things in a proper order. Extend the same grace to others that you received from God. And learn to endure hardship, seeing God's hand at work instead of your circumstances. Isaiah 40 says, But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Then we go to kindness and goodness. These that really work hand in hand. Kindness is an authentic, genuine, sincere desire to do good to people. Good is right there in kindness. And goodness is the inner kindness that outwardly projects the character of God. It's like you just can't separate the two. So with kindness, don't pray for opportunities because they are around you every day. Glenn Campbell sings this song or sang this song. He's passed away, I believe, now. Um, He talks about seeing somebody, your brother, standing on the side of the road with a heavy load. And don't just pass by. If you try a little kindness, then you'll overlook the blindness. That blindness is voluntary when we look away from people in need. And for goodness, understand that goodness is not always niceness but maybe we could say it is rightness. Pray for the integrity to do the right thing. Goodness is justness. It's not always easy to do. You can expect confrontations with injustice and occasions where you need to stand up for what is right and understand that good people will not just walk away from a situation where kindness and goodness needs to be applied. Proverbs 25 says, Like a muddied spring or polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Faithfulness. It's devotion to both God and people. Realize that God never changes. He is true to his word. And he will keep his promises forever. You and I, too, are to reflect that. So I'm just going to say this. Go ahead and make promises to people, but then be sure that you keep them. And by doing so, you will set yourself up as an example for them to see you are faithful. Gentleness is not weakness, but it is a choice to defer to others, particularly when you're harshly treated. Learn to forgive of you as you have already been forgiven and try to live at peace with all people. Proverbs 15 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. It's true. It really works out. And then there's self-control. So glad Pastor Ben did not assign me that one. It's not willpower to not eat too much or to exercise more, but it is focused power. To restrain yourself from retaliation or retribution. To voluntarily respond instead of involuntarily React. James says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. 
So if I were to summarize this list, I would say it this way. We always tend to pray for these things, but then they never really show up in fullness. Because we tend to use our prayers as an excuse. You know, I prayed for all that stuff, but God didn't give it to me. Stop praying. Stop praying for what you already have. Sometimes we pray way too much and we do too little. From a practical standpoint, from my own experience, it's like an employee who sits all day in his boss's office and says how much I like you as a manager. You're doing a great job. I love my work. I love to do, I can do all these things for you. But then you never really get onto the floor and put the gloves on and put it to action. The opportunities are there. If you are a believer, you already have the, the divine genetics inside you for all of these things. So stop being hearers of the word and start being doers of the word. You can do it. Maybe baby steps again. But you can do it. And continuously bear fruit. That fruit for all seasons. In 1814, there was a story written about a man. I didn't read the story, but I got the cliff notes. It's a man in a museum, very particular, loves intricate little details, and the man is going through this museum. It's a, one of those old ones that you see in the paintings, big gallery. And he's walking around the edge, looking at all the little containers, and all the little glass cases, checking out every little piece in there. He walks around the entire perimeter, gets to the other side. All the little cases, thousands of them, he spends the day in there, and then he walks out so happy that he saw all the things in the museum, except the main event in that lobby was a giant elephant. He never saw it. There's an elephant in this room, and maybe you're not seeing it either. The elephant came in last Saturday when a terrorist group of people attacked God's chosen people, Israel, for no apparent reason. And the elephant is, how do we show goodness and kindness to our enemies. For me to parse out this week's events and how we walk through that is a bit much to take care of in the time that we have. But it still applies to each of us because we have perhaps not enemies who are threatening to kill us, but we have people who oppose us. We have adversaries. We run into them all the time. We probably just walk away or avoid them. But Jesus says this. One of the most difficult things I think Jesus said. Luke 6, Luke 6, 27. But I say to you that here, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. That really led to a greater level of challenge in my message this morning than I was really hoping to have to deal with. But in a way, I'm glad. Because it is always on our mind. If we're to be good and kind, how do we be good and kind to those who don't love us, even hate us? It's perhaps the most controversial topic for my human nature to deal with as well. Prayerfully, I asked God to help me through this. And he, I believe, gave me this response to those four words, love, do good, bless, and pray. We love 
those who are considered our adversaries by nurturing a genuine concern for their eternal destiny. To see them as God sees them, having the potential to turn away from evil and actually be redeemed. That's how we love them. Do good by harboring a desire to do the right thing, not to assist evil in any way, but to resist evil. Then to be the moral compass and the gateway that can redirect those who are misguided into the gates of God's kingdom. Then bless by showing kindness in returning good instead of returning evil for evil. By removing the fuel from the fire, taking the wind out of the sails, by using a soft and gentle response to turn away wrath. And then pray. Pray that every, be, every encounter becomes an opportunity to change a wayward heart, to snatch a backslider from the fire, to see God's redemptive power at work through you by the spirit he has placed in you. And then understand, our own depravity first, be, before analyzing and judging others. Because Paul said this to a church that was deep in sin. For such were some of you. In 1994, I know the date because I wrote it down on there. I wrote a poem, and I was not a poet. I started to write a little story, and I found that as I got halfway through the sentence, it seemed that it changed, like God was leading me to write this. When I got finished with that poem, I set it down on the desk, and I left. And the next day, I returned back just to see if that was real, and the paper was still there, and it was. And I'm probably making this out to be more profound than it is, but to me, it was a miracle how this got written. There was a man who carried me all throughout my life. He carried me through happiness, hardship, and strife. I never realized he'd been carrying me everywhere around until the day that he set me down on the ground. I turned to see who had carried me, only to find he had been nailed to a tree. The blood from his wounds now freely flowed, and I knew it was a payment for the price that I owed. I gazed at the sight, and I dropped to my knee because the blood that he was shedding now poured down on me. In shock, I did realize, and I dared not to stand, because the hammer that drove those nails, I held in my own hand. I can't speak for you, and I can't speak for the world. But I can only say, my sins nailed Jesus to that cross. And I have no basis of judging anyone else, ever, for anything. Worship team, if you would please come. In response to what has happened this week and the things that are currently going on and will continue, I'm sure, I want to read this psalm. It's Psalm 21, 121. 
It says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He, will, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guide your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Sometimes I feel it's the right thing to do is to write out a prayer. I didn't quite do that. But this morning I just sat there and I asked God, we've got to pray for Israel. The word says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that peace has certainly been disrupted many times in the past. And as we get closer to the end, it will be even more. I don't know that this is the beginning of the end, but I think... Uh, Churchill said it's the beginning of the beginning of the end. But it's definitely a big deal. So I want us to just bow our heads and pray through that list of the fruit of the Spirit. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the peace and the safety that we have in this country, but we know that it will not always be such. But right now we see your people in turmoil unjustly for so many centuries being treated this way. Got to pray for love. That love will have an opportunity to show itself amongst the people of that nation, neighbors and families and even among strangers. And that your love will be expressed. And that joy, like Jesus, your joy was set before you when you saw the cross. And you endured its pain because joy is not temporary. It's not happiness. It's an eternal gladness. And for peace, especially for those, Lord, who are in captivity right now, who have been taken and are now held captives, I pray for a special divine peace, whether they know you or not, but will lead them to know where that peace came from. And patience for all to endure the hardships and the ongoing pestilence and, and violence and tragedy to look for your plan to be carried out and for goodness and kindness to overrule the brutality and the abuse and faithfulness we know God that you are faithful and that your promise back in Genesis that for those who bless your people, you will bless. And for those who curse your people, you will curse. I don't pronounce or ask a curse on anybody, but I, pray, I ask, Lord, that you withdraw the blessing from those who are attacking and that you cause confusion amongst their ranks. And that the, the heavenly realm that is orchestrating all this will also fall into confusion and disarray. And that you will be faithful and walk your people through all of it and that self-control would reign voluntarily or involuntarily that hatred would be reduced anti-semitism would be reduced because we already see that on the rise that evil in every form will ultimately be defeated and that your plan will be completed and that you will bring all of your people into your household, into your eternal home. God, may it be so. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Lord, we thank you, God, for the word from Pastor Rocky this morning, God. May we take those things, Lord God, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, patience, gentleness, and self-control, 
into our lives this morning, God, this week, God. Let us look for you, God, to show us ways to encourage those in Israel, Lord God, but also those in our backyard, Lord, whoever we come in contact with, God. Show us what is the right thing to do for your glory and for your honor, Lord Jesus. Oh, we love you, Lord. Use us. Use us, God, that your kingdom would be furthered on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Encourage each other as you leave this morning. Love on one another. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.church.